Celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. The topic today is the seven vices and virtues and how they go with the seven visible planets. For a while I've been wanting to play around with this one a little bit because there's so many sevens in everything that we look at, especially dating back to, you know, more ancient times. But we talk about the seven rays in esoteric studies, the seven days of the week, which definitely relate to the seven planets, the seven colors of the rainbow, the seven notes of the scale, seven seas, seven continents, seven brides for seven brothers, the magnificent seven. Everywhere you look, there's 777, seven, seven, and it's a spiritual number. And you've got right from Genesis, you know, God created the world and the heavens and all of that in seven days. Well, I guess in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. So I used to make jokes about the seven deadly sins, and I would say, when I was younger, my favorite sin was lust. But now that I'm older, my favorite sin is gluttony. Now, there's some truth to that. But if I really look hard at myself and how I operate on a kind of moment to moment basis, or let's say through the course of my work day, uh, I have another sin that is worse than that. And I'll confess it to you in just a little while. So we also know that there are seven chakras that we hear about in yogic studies. And most people have at least been a little bit exposed to that, but I'm going to explain that for a minute. So a chakra is maybe a receiver within our auric sphere, something like that, that picks up on, let's say, maybe cosmic energies. They say that they are maybe a spinning wheel inside of us or a wheel of energy, and possibly they extend their energy outward from us. Um, I was reading some things online because you can find everything online now, nowadays. And they were talking about kind of how far the different chakras might um, extend their energy. So just to go through those, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the uh, Vedic or Hindu Sanskrit names for the chakras, but the first one and I don't have an illustration of this per se. It is below the base of the spine, and it's kind of where the energy starts up from, and it's called the root chakra in a sort of English nickname for it. And I'll go into the correspondences with the planets in just a little bit, but the root chakra is sort of our base or our basic instincts. It does have to do with sexuality and it does have to do with survival instincts. And of course, you know, sex is the way that the species survives, so it has that connection there. And the next chakra is below the navel or close around the navel and has more to do with our maybe processing of things, if you think of it sort of near the intestines. And then up from there is above the waistline. The area would be called the solar plexus, and that has to do with willpower. Um, and there's a lot of correspondences. Then the heart chakra, and of course that has to do with love and sort of um, beneficence, perhaps. The sh throat chakra, which would have to do with communication. The third eye that has to do with perception, and then the crown chakra that has to do with our connection to the universe. And you know, that's located up in the part of the head that is very soft, and the skull isn't fully formed in a baby's head when it first emerges, and oh, guess what? That's the first thing to come out of the mother's womb. And we even talk about during the birthing process, that the baby is crowning. We're starting to see the crown of the scalp or the crown chakra come out. So it's very possible, and of course we don't know this, but it's very possible that the 
soul or spirit sort of enters the body through that crown chakra as the baby is emerging from the mother's womb. And it's also very possible that the crown chakra is the last connection between the body and this plane and where the spirit or soul is going after it's finished with the body on this plane. And that reminds me of when my mother was in the process of dying and we knew for a few days that it was her last days. And my sister who works with you know, some chakra energy and she had been studying um, pendulum work. And you can do that at a distance like you do with Reiki, which she also knows. And you can use like a teddy bear or a you know, toy doll or something like that to represent the person at a distance. So she had something representing my mother and she went up through the chakras with her pendulum. And you know, she gets on the root chakra, there's no action, no energy, and she goes up you know, the navel, the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, even the third eye, nothing. The pendulum's doing nothing. She gets up to the crown chakra, vroom, vroom, vroom. The pendulum's going crazy. And she goes, wow, I wonder what this means. So she called up the woman she had studied this pendulum work with and asked her about it. And the woman said, oh, all your mother's spiritual energy has ascended to the crown chakra and is getting ready to exit for her graduation is what I like to call it. So I thought that's very interesting that we kind of come in with the crown energy and we exit with the crown energy. And the sort of teaching in yogic traditions is that the kundalini, the spiritual energy rises from the root chakra through all the chakras in order and then you know, when it gets to the crown chakra, that's sort of our enlightenment point. So we might say that people would have different uh, either flowing energy through their different chakras or sometimes blocked energies in one or more of the chakras. And when we relate those to the planets, then we can be looking in a person's birth chart, which is sort of like your instructions for your lesson plan in this lifetime, and we might see from your own planets which ones are playing with the other planets more nicely or which ones are having conflicts. And those conflicts might be the ones that tell us which of your chakra systems or energy areas is being more blocked or needs to be worked on. So I also thought about this in terms of those seven deadly sins. So I looked those up. And I'm sure there's some different names for them, but I've put them in a table and I've aligned them with the different planets that basically I assigned to them because I didn't see anybody really talking about this. Although I have to say, I did not look in great length on the internet for this. The chakra part and how that related to the planets. And we're dealing here just with the seven original heavenly bodies including the sun and moon, which are not planets. They are what we call the luminaries or the lights, but they're treated as if they're planets for the purposes of astrology. So most of the Vedic sources, and Vedic is that word for the India Indian type of astrology, most of those sources had a certain alignment of the planets with the chakras. And there was one other source I was looking at that I kind of liked better what they were talking about, especially how it related to the vices and the virtues. But I put them both in this table. So if you look from actually the bottom up in the center column, those are the easy one, two, three, four, five, six, seven assignments of the planets um, or heavenly bodies kind of in their um, order their solar system order. So in other words, Saturn is the furthest out, Jupiter's the next one in, Mars, then we have Earth, but you know, we're on Earth, so we're in an astrology chart, we're not looking at Earth, because we're on it. And then you've got Mercury between Earth and the Sun, and then the Moon is really the fastest heavenly body from our viewpoint, because it's closest to us and it's going around us once a month. So that ended up at the top of the list. And I kind of liked how this uh, one source was connecting one planet per chakra. 
and I kind of didn't like so much how the sun and moon were lo lumped together as the luminaries relating both to the third eye chakra. So you can study this on your own and see how you feel about it. Now what that means up there at number seven in the center column, K2, spelled K-E-T-U, that's one of two positions in a chart where there's nothing there really in the sky, but the Vedic system treats these as planets. They're called the north and south nodes, N-O-D-E-S, of the moon. And we've talked about that before on Looking Up. It comes from the intersection of two very important orbits. So there's the orbit of the Earth going around the sun. And while we're going around the sun, the moon's going around the Earth. So there are two places where these two orbits intersect. They're kind of at an angle to one another. And for half of each month, the moon comes above the Earth-Sun orbit. And for half of the month, it goes below the Earth-Sun orbit. So when it changes to the above, that's called the North Ascending Node, or North Node. And that's the one called Rahu. And then when it goes below the Earth-Sun orbit, that's K2, the South Node. And in astrology, we interpret these nodes as saying, where are we coming from and where are we headed to? And maybe if I had checked some more sources, they would have said both nodes relate to the crown chakra because what I've just told you about crowning and the exit would give us the idea of where we came from. We came from our mother's body or we came from spirit or we came from our past lives. And where are we headed to? Well, we're headed through this life, through our chakras and back out the crown, back to spirit back to the universe, the solar system, our next incarnation, whatever. <laughs> and I like to tell people, be careful how you live in this lifetime, because this lifetime is the past life of your future life. So if we're being careful about our karma. Um, so let's talk about this, maybe from the standpoint of, hmm, okay. The virtues and the vices, let's go to that because that may relate back some to some of the chakras. So we hear about the seven deadly sins and uh, I'm sure this is from Christianity and maybe even from Judeo-Christian teachings, probably. I don't know that they talk about these sins in the Vedic or you know Sanskrit Hindu um, philosophy. So, <clears throat> They also relate with what are called the contrary virtues. And these are the virtues that if you practice them, then it tries to protect you from the temptation to enter into those seven deadly sins or vices. <clears throat> so I'll go kind of bottom up. If we talk about sloth as the deadly sin, and that means laziness, it's not the little monkey-like creature. Um, it means lack of caring about something to the point of doing something or taking responsibility for activities. And Saturn to me is what relates to this because Saturn is the planet of responsibility. And the opposite of sloth would be diligence or working hard at something. So say you have Saturn very strong in your chart. Perhaps you're a Capricorn, which is the sign that Saturn rules. Or maybe even Aquarius, which is the sign that Saturn ruled before we discovered Uranus. So Saturn is that planet where we see the rings around it, which gives us the idea of kind of corralling something in, maybe corralling in your bad tendencies. Or we would say if um, <clears throat> those signs might be strong in your chart, or actually the planet Saturn. So Saturn has its greatest power in the chart when it's the highest in the sky, up in what we would call the 10th house of the house grid. And if you want to see things about what signs go with what planets, go with what houses, you can always go to my website, astrologybooth.com, and in the study booth, in the beginner's topics at the bottom, you have to scroll down in the menu list, is the Astrologer's Apprentice Cheat Sheet. 
and that lists all of these with keywords. So if Saturn is that um, organizing principle where we take stock of what we have under our control and try to be a good uh, steward of those things. So the traditional Vedic system assigns this to the root chakra and kind of says that that is our base. You know, when we think about, we come into this school of life and it's a 3D or 4D, really a four dimensional reality. You know, you've got your three dimensions, width, height, depth, I don't know, weight maybe goes with that. But time is another dimension that goes with that. And time really is measured by the planetary movements. We've got a year, that's the sun through all the seasons. We've got a month, that's the moon through all the signs. And we've even got the day, and that's the turning of our planet on its axis to rotate and face all the four directions in all 12 signs of the zodiac. So Saturn as the Lord of Time, in fact, its Greek name was Kronos, which is the same word as synchronicity and chronological and a chronometer would be another name for a watch or a clock, a keeper of time. So it keeps us in line as the ultimate timekeeper. And maybe we, you know, each of us have our certain amount of time that we've been allotted to do our lesson plan. So the next one coming up the line is the sin or vice being greed and the contrary virtue being abstinence. Now this doesn't mean like abstinence from drinking per se. No, I'm sorry, it might mean that. It doesn't mean abstinence from sex. We're gonna see that later under chastity. This is more like foregoing the multitudes that might be uh, available for you. So if you think about Zen and how they're very minimalist, and if you stay like at a, maybe a Zen meditation center, and if you have a you know bedroom you're renting there, it's not gonna have much in it. It's gonna be maybe those screens and a bed, maybe a bedside table, possibly a dresser, maybe a vase with a flower, but it's not gonna have all the stuff that you see in the typical hotel room in the West. You know, so it's sort of to have only those things that are really needed and not to try to greedily consume or acquire or hoard more than what you need. There's even the thought in the Northwest Indians of the American continent or North American continent where it was a sin to have too much wealth and they would have these ceremonies called the potluck where the richest person no, potlatch, haha, <laughs> potluck is something different. Okay, potlatch ceremony, where the richest person or family would give things away to all the other families in the community. Now they might have to pay the blanket weaver to get the blankets that they then give away, or the pot maker, or the knife maker, or whatever. So it prospers for the whole culture, or their whole society, by nobody holding on too much to all of the wealth. So when you think about Jupiter, it's the biggest planet, and it has to do with largesse. And uh, in our charts, it rules the signs of Sagittarius, which is travel and the whole world, um, and the world of knowledge. And it also rules Pisces, before we discovered Neptune and assigned it that to Pisces, assigned. And um, so Pisces is kind of the sign of universality, and oneness and not individual. It's like the drop in the ocean. The individual is the drop in the ocean. The ocean is the Pisces, ocean of spirit. So when we think of Jupiter as its vice is trying to have too much and the contrary or counteracting virtue is to abstain from having too much. So again, if you're looking at your chart, you might see that Jupiter is a strong planet for you in that maybe it's rising, or maybe it's, you know, at one of those four angles are the four directions of the chart, culminating, anti-culminating, rising, setting. Near those four points are for the power planet, or power places in a chart. Um, 
ninth house is just before the culmination. That's one of the Jupiter-ruled houses. Twelfth house is just before the rising. So we can see that it's already got that power position of being near or, or its home place in a chart would be one of those four angles or near two of those four with the two signs that it rules. Okay. I also would say when you're looking at your chart, if you have a strong what we call aspect or angular connection between a planet to that rising point, and the rising point is the main place where we kind of dawn into the world and show ourselves to others. And the top point has a lot to do with our reputation in the outer world as well. So perhaps Jupiter connecting to one of those two angles, even from somewhere else in the chart, it might lead you more towards that either sin of greed or acquisition or that contrary virtue of minimalism, abstinence. So coming up the list, we come to Mars and um, yeah, there was very little correspondence between those two different alignments for the planets and the chakras. But Mars is, the vice is anger. And that makes sense because it's the god of war. It even has a little red tinge to it. And we say when we're angry, we see red. Isn't that funny? And the opposite of anger, you might say maybe it's going to be happiness or acceptance or something like that. But it turns out here in the contrary virtues, it's patience. And I thought that's very interesting because Mars and its associated sign of Aries can be always in a rush, in a hurry. It's about speed. And so to be patient is to slow down. And I think patience in a way, it kind of requires some trust because the in a hurry is sort of like, oh, what if I miss my chance? Something like that. So it's not like trusting that everything will come together in its good time, in which case I also see my time is rolling here. So that's Mars. Venus, that's the only one where there was absolute correspondence between two lists and the chakras. The heart chakra, of course, because it's love. And it has as its virtue liberality, ex acceptance, loving of all, unconditional love. And as its vice, it has lust. And that's what we might call loving inappropriately, or loving too much, or loving love for love's sake. You can lust after other things besides love or sex. You can lust after money as well. And it's not too different from that idea of greed, of wanting, you know, of desire. So we have um, next, we have Mercury, and that has as its vice, oh, I'm sorry. I think I did this wrong. How did I have greed twice? Okay. Um, liberality and greed for Venus. Oh, oh goody. Jupiter, where I had greed for Jupiter, I would have left off my favorite vice. Gluttony. My current favorite. Okay. So, you know, if there's such a correspondence really between greed and gluttony. Gluttony is just sort of a greed for food. So we have greed for money things as the Venus vice. And we can see that because Venus not only rules love, but it also rules money. And greed more comes in in the money category. Okay, so that one, when we get up to Mercury, here we have chastity and lust. Oh, okay. Now, when I think about chastity, it sounds a lot like virgins. And Virgo is one of the two signs that Mercury rules. So it has that purity to it. And the opposite of the purity, that would be the lust. Okay. And if I didn't mention it, Venus rules Taurus and Libra. So we have for the planets from all the, the planets, the ones that go around the sun, they all have two signs that they're associated with. But when we get to the sun and the moon, which are the lights or the luminaries, they just have one sign associated with it. So the sun is associated with Leo, the moon with Cancer. We have for the sun's vice, pride. 
that's pretty easy to understand because the sun is sort of the center of the solar system and it's all about attention and shine and look at me and aren't I proud of this. And what's that phrase, pride goeth before a fall? Falls usually are associated with Saturn. Well, what is Saturn? It's the comeuppance or the chickens coming home to roost. Saturn is the main planet of karma and it's not always bad. Saturn likes to reward us for our good behavior and mm, I'll say punish but point out to us our flaws and faults for our bad behavior because how else do we learn and life is about learning. So pride as the sin of the sun and humility as the virtue, the counteracting virtue. So you might find also that these tendencies towards these sins or these um, virtues if you need to counteract your sins are very strongly related to your rising sign and that's the sign that's coming up over the eastern horizon at the time of your birth you do have to know your birth time to find out your rising sign and sometimes you even need your birth time to find out your moon sign because the moon changes signs every two to three days so here we have the sun and moon are combined and assigned to the sixth chakra or in one system the moon connecting to the universe was the seventh chakra. The moon's vice is envy and the moon's virtue is kindness. And so envy might say, you know, I see what everybody else has, why don't I have that? It's related to insecurity and that's one of the things that the moon is very strong about is about security issues, just like Saturn is all about control issues. So when you feel that you have what you need and you're in a secure place, then it's easy to be kind. Or if you know you're trying to aspire towards, you know, graduating out nicely out your crown chakra, kindness is one of the best things that you can extend to your fellow humankind, we might even say. So we didn't talk a whole lot about all these chakras, but well, the throat, I think, does definitely go with the Mercury chakra because it's the voice, and that's where the voice box is. And Mercury's the communication. So I leave it to you to take a little time to look on the internet, see something about the chakras, contemplate your own chart with vices and virtues, and you know, see what planet connects strongest to your rising sign, and what is that rising sign? And how are you on sort of the spectrum or scale between the vice end and the virtue end? Because we can always, in this school of life, work towards the virtues and away from the vices. So I hope this has been fun, a little departure from the usual things we talk at. And that is my timer says, oh, we are done. And come back and see me again soon on... Oh.